Be honest, have you ever stolen something? Maybe you snuck your sibling's phone to play games without them knowing, or maybe you swiped a pack of cookies from the store. These might be small indiscretions, but compared to some things that have been stolen throughout history, they're downright pathetic. I mean, what's a pack of cookies compared to an entire house, a giant ship, or even a skyscraper? Yeah, get ready to be schooled in the art of stealing as we take a look at even more of the biggest things that have ever been stolen. Takes a lot. If I could drive any vehicle on Earth, it'd be a tank. They're huge, they're intimidating, and they've got great big cannons on the front. They're the perfect vehicle in my opinion. Of course, I'd need the right credentials. Not just anyone can drive these war machines. Though, try telling that to Sean Nelson. On the evening of May 17, 1995, the citizens of San Diego who were commuting through the city witnessed the terrifying sight of a tank rolling down the streets. Former U.S. Marine Sean Nelson had swiped an M60A3 Patton tank from the California National Guard Armory and was rampaging through the neighborhood. Now, an M60A3 tank is some 31 feet long and weighs more than 57 tons fully loaded. Luckily, this tank wasn't loaded, but still, not even the biggest fire truck of the time would have been weighty enough to stop this rolling monster. As Nelson plowed through the streets, he destroyed vehicles, crushed lampposts, and rolled through barricades. Luckily, no one was seriously injured. Pursued by police, Nelson's joyride came to a halt after he drove onto a road barrier, getting stuck in the process. Police opened the hatch and ordered the thief to surrender, but Nelson refused and then, well, let's just say he didn't survive the removal process. The danger was over, but how did he steal a tank from the National Guard Armory? A facility surrounded by eight-foot chain-link fences topped with three runs of barbed wire to stop trespassers from entering. Not to mention all the military personnel on site? Well, that evening, the armory's gates were unsecured because the personnel were working late. At 6.30 p.m., Nelson simply drove into the compound completely uncontested before breaking the locks on not one, not two, but three different tanks before starting the M60A3. At 6.45, he crashed through the gates and rolled onto his rampage. Sometimes, just sometimes, I wonder what my tax money is actually doing. Empire State of Crime we always hear about robbers making off with phones, jewelry, and cash. <laughs> Pedestrian. How about a building? And not just any building. Back in 2008, the New York Daily News pulled off one of the biggest heists in US history by stealing the most iconic skyscraper in America, the Empire State Building. Before you ask, no, the reporters didn't heave the 1,400 feet tall tower away. Instead, they stole it through the magic of paperwork. Journalists from the news submitted fake documents to the city's clerk's office seeking to transfer the Empire State Building into their hands. The deed had the name Nellitz Properties LLC, which, as some of you may have noticed, is stolen spelled backwards. If that wasn't cheeky enough, they listed King Kong star Fay Ray and infamous bank robber Willie Sutton as witness and notary. Just 90 minutes later, the Empire State Building was legally transferred from Empire State Land Associates to the fictitious Nellitz Company owned by the newspaper. Don't worry, the reporters didn't turn the building into their own personal penthouse. The very next day, they returned the $2 billion building to its rightful owners. What was the reason for this elaborate stunt? The best kind of reason, to prove a point. The newspaper aimed to expose a glaring flaw in the city's register office. Clerks didn't need to cross-check information, leading to all sorts of chaos in the way the city documented deeds, mortgages, and other transactions. The Daily News uncovered cases where criminals pretending to be long-dead homeowners snagged fake property deeds and walked away with thousands in mortgage cash. Interesting. If you'll excuse me, I need to send some forms off to New York City's registry office regarding a new BMA's New York office. All this thievery is making me nervous. Do you know what you should do before some bandit swipes your mouse? Click those like and subscribe buttons, of course. All right, what have we got next? Son of a beach. There's nothing I like better than a trip to the coast, swimming in the sea, munching on an ice cream, swiping an entire beach for the illegal sand trade. Wait, what? Yeah, back in 2008 in Trelawney, Jamaica, a whole beach was stolen overnight. Whoa. They must have been trying to build one big sandcastle. 
The Sandy Fangered Thieves made a clean getaway with an estimated 500 truckloads full of sand from Coral Springs Beach. Rather suspiciously, no eyewitnesses have come forward, so how it was stolen is a mystery. The thieves may have done it by hand, like the sand miners in Ghana, or it could have been pinched by giant excavators. An excavator can dig up to 1,000 cubic yards per day, and that's the equivalent of 1,000 hot tubs worth of sand. Since the heist, there have been no signs of the suspects or sand. With 1,300 feet of missing earth, the sheer scale of the heist has led some to point fingers at hotel companies. Some suggest that these companies took the sand to refurbish their own private beaches or to thwart the competition by preventing rival resorts from opening on their turf. The level of corruption may reach the highest law in the land. Even police and politicians have been accused of colluding with the beach burglars. You see, sand thieves are nasty customers. Activists, journalists, and government officials who've dared to stand against them often end up vanishing just as mysteriously as the sand. This grainy stuff isn't just for digging in. It's the main ingredient in cement, concrete, and glass. A global sand shortage has unleashed violent black market gangs who've cleared away rivers, beaches, and even small islands, destroying habitats and wildlife in the process. Sadly, the problem is expected to worsen as the world's population grows along with the demand for infrastructure. All of this over sand? That's gonna take me a while to process. Hijack Ahoy. The old saying goes, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That's certainly true for a cruise liner that was once stolen. Okay, it wasn't one of those fancy modern cruise ships, it was the Achille Laura, which was technically stolen way back in 1985. This Italian cruise ship was 82 feet in width at the beam, that's the ship's widest point for us landlubbers, and stretched a colossal 642 feet in length. That's longer than the Washington Monument is tall. How do you steal something like that? Surely you can't just hijack a ship that large by carrying it away. That'd be far too obvious and it'd require hundreds of helicopters to achieve. Even steering it off course would draw attention. It's way too big to steal, or so you'd think. On October 7th, shortly after setting sail from Alexandria, Egypt, a steward found four men trying to clean petrol off their machine guns with a hairdryer. These guys had been masquerading as passengers, but were in fact hijackers there to seize the boat. Upon being found out, they sprang into action, charging into the dining hall, claiming there were 20 armed men on board the ship. There were only 97 passengers on board, most of whom were elderly or disabled. The other 651 tourists on board the ship had stayed behind in Egypt to sightsee Alexandria, so there wasn't much the rest could do against the four militants. The hijackers radioed Syrian authorities demanding the release of their imprisoned pals and permission to dock in a Syrian port. Syria never replied. Things were beginning to turn ugly when on October 9th, a terrorist commander arranged for the Loro to dock in Egypt. After trying and failing to escape, the terrorists were taken into custody with the help of US and Italian authorities and convicted. The Loro's luck didn't improve after resuming service. In 1994, she caught fire off the coast of Somalia and sank. Man, that boat just hit a wave of bad luck. Clergy Quandary We all have that fear that a thief is going to break into our home and make off with our belongings, but what if the thief made off with your home? Back in 2021 in Luton, UK, this exact scenario happened. Mike Hall was a vicar who'd been working away from his Luton home, fulfilling his holy duties in North Wales. In August, out of the blue, his neighbors called, telling him that they'd seen an intruder in his home. Understandably worried, Hall rushed back to Luton only to find that the keys to his front door no longer fit. A stranger opened the door and Hall forced his way in. Once inside, the vicar found his Luton house looted. The plaster on his wall stripped bare. It turned out the stranger was a builder who was renovating his home. He demanded an explanation because he hadn't ordered any building works. That's when someone else appeared and told the confounded clergyman that the house they were all standing in was his and that it was the vicar who was trespassing. It turned out while Hall was away, thieves had broken into his home through a window and changed the locks. Then these cunning fraudsters used a fake driving license to impersonate the reverend, created a bogus bank account in his name, and phoned up solicitors claiming to be Hall. They instructed them to sell the house for 131,000 pounds, a little over $150,000, way below the house's real market value, so that it'd sell quickly. Consequently, the new owners now legally possessed the home and there was nothing the police could do. 
It sounds stranger than fiction, but as I'm making this video right now, the case is still ongoing. No arrests have been made and the new owners are still refusing to hand the house back to its rightful owner. Jeez, that poor priest must be living a hellish nightmare. School's out forever. Let's be honest, some days we all wish our school would just vanish, right? Well, for students at Utzig Secondary School in Cape Town, South Africa, that wish came true. The story starts back in 2019 when the secondary school, that's the equivalent of an American high school, had to close its doors. The neighborhood was taken over by violent criminal gangs, people were being threatened, and the school became a target for terrible vandalism. Utsik even tried employing security guards, but the crooks chased them off, turning the area into a war zone, with staff and students often getting caught in the crossfire. Following this, the finances set aside for the school's repairs dried up fast, leading it to deteriorate until it shut down completely. Back in the day, the school used to show off an auditorium, cafeteria, and five classroom blocks. Since then, thieves have pillaged the building brick by brick, leaving only a carcass of what was once a school. Take a peek at Google Earth and you'll see how the school disappeared in just six months. Everything from windows, electrics, plumbing, and blackboards were scavenged. Rumor has it that they sold the bricks for 31 cents each and $6.23 for every window. So next time you find yourself complaining about school, just be glad it didn't vanish off the face of Google Earth. Cedar later. Let's head over to Vancouver Island, Canada, where the trees are as nice as the people. Or at least they were until 2012. Back in May of that fateful year, park rangers from Carmenau Walbrin Provincial Park stumbled across an 800-year-old red cedar tree with a rather suspicious cut. Hmm, trees don't usually have that now, do they? The tree had 80% of its 9-foot-wide trunk severed and park officials decided that it was unsafe to leave the tree upright. So they cut it down. Then they left the tree to naturally decompose and become a home for wildlife. Little did they know that this was all part of a devious plan. Once the officials had felled the tree, the illegal loggers who had sliced the tree through in the first place returned and dragged it away piece by piece. Police were stomped as to who the cedar stealers were and it's unlikely that they'll catch them, unless one of them starts selling some jumbo-sized wood carvings. The thieves managed to obscure the tire tracks left on the forest floor, leaving little evidence to work with. A western red cedar can grow over 230 feet tall, so those poachers wouldn't have been your run-of-the-mill lumberjacks. They would have needed heavy-duty equipment and giant trucks. A firewood salvager in a pickup truck just wouldn't have had the capacity to carry off an entire tree that size. Unfortunately, this type of tree poaching is becoming more popular. Since 1853, about 90% of Vancouver Island's low-elevation forests, where the largest, oldest trees can be found, have been logged. What's the root of all this tree swindling? Well, a large western red cedar can fetch thousands of dollars through the production of shakes, shingles, and various other wood products. The park is pretty uninhabited and only protected by a few rangers, so the criminals could carry out their heist uninterrupted. You know, there's plenty of other less environmentally damaging heist opportunities out there. Those thieves should really branch out. Hop lift. Back in April 2021, over in Stolten, Worcestershire, UK, rabbit breeder Annette Edwards woke up to find that her beloved pet rabbit, Darius, had gone. Now, Darius wasn't any bog-standard bunny. He held the Guinness World Record for being the biggest rabbit on the planet. He was a continental giant rabbit, weighed in at a colossal 35 pounds, and measured in at an unreal 4 foot 3 inches from paw to paw. That makes this bunny two and a half times as heavy as a standard bowling ball and about as long as an average eight-year-old child is tall. To support his huge size, he ate some 11 carrots a day. That's about 4,000 carrots a year. That's the same with me if you replace the carrots with burgers and a year with a month. Anyways, Edwards, who specializes in the Continental Giant breed, was devastated. She even offered over $1,200 as a reward for his safe return before doubling it to over $2,700 to no avail. So, who stole this giant rabbit? A giant fox? Probably not. Edwards believes the abduction of Darius was masterminded by human thieves because to reach Darius's hutch, they would have had to navigate a neighboring field and bust open the bolts. Visitors used to come and take pictures with Darius, so many people knew the layout of Edwards's home. 
The thieves likely targeted him because his hutch was away from the other rabbits, which are guarded by dogs, making him an easy catch. In his prime, Darius was a sire rabbit used for breeding, although when he was stolen at the age of 12, he was too old for any of that nonsense. So what would someone even want with this giant rabbit? Well, there is one unsettling internet theory. At the peak of his record-breaking fame, Darius was reportedly insured for an unreal $1.6 million, had his own agent, and traveled with a bodyguard. Now, continental giant rabbits only tend to live until they're about five years old, so at 12, Darius wasn't just an old man, he was an ancient man. Like a lot of insurance clauses, if a pet passes away from natural causes, nothing can be claimed. But if it's stolen or looks like there's foul play, then there's usually something to be gained. Hmm. Now, I'm not hopping to any conclusions, but what do you guys think happened to this big old bunny? Let me know down in the comments below. Penny Pincher. I've always got a few loose coins jingling in my pocket, but imagine looking around this behemoth, the Canadian Big Maple Leaf. The prodigious penny was 1.2 inches thick and 20.8 inches in diameter. That's twice as big as a dinner plate. It was made from pure 24 karat gold and weighed in at an incredible 22 pounds, giving it a value of $4.3 million. Now that's a coin that could literally break the bank. One side showcased Queen Elizabeth II, on the other was Canada's national symbol, the maple leaf, hence its name. Issued by the Royal Canadian Mint in 2007, it proudly held the Guinness World Record for the largest gold coin. Until 2011, when a one-ton Australian coin outdid them. All was well in the world of oversized coins until 2017, when the big maple leaf coin was, you guessed it, stolen. It was on display at the Bodhi Museum in Berlin when one night four audacious robbers pulled off their heist. Three of the four climbed onto adjacent train tracks. Using a ladder as a makeshift bridge, they broke into the museum through a third floor window with the help of a shady security guard. The thieves then smashed through a bulletproof glass case and made off with the coin using a wheelbarrow and a skateboard. Really? A skateboard? Sorry, I just assumed that a heist of this magnitude would require advanced equipment rather than random stuff you'd find in just about anybody's garage. Anyway, an investigation was opened and the four men were eventually arrested. It was gold particles in their getaway car and on their clothes that led detectives to deduce that the coin was cut into pieces or melted down and sold. Another clue came from one of the thieves' phones having an internet history full of searches on how to break down gold pieces. Huh. In court, three of the four men were found guilty and imprisoned while the fourth was acquitted. I hope after this, those robbers start seeing sense. No Sphinx off my nose. The Great Sphinx of Giza is an iconic Egyptian landmark, depicting a mythological creature with a lion's body and a human's face. It's as majestic as it is mysterious. Despite its fame, no one's entirely sure on who built the Sphinx, though most agree it was King Khafra of the 4th Dynasty, which put its construction around 2500 BCE. But an even greater mystery is what happened to its nose. At some point in history, the beast would have possessed a three-foot-wide sniffer until it was intentionally chiseled away and stolen. Talk about happening right under your, well, nose. Over the years, people have come up with all sorts of theories as to what happened to it. A popular legend is that in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte's soldiers blew the thing off with cannon fire. However, most archaeologists turn their nose up at this myth as it contradicts drawings from 1737 by Danish explorer Frederick Louis Norden, who depicted the statue without its schnoz. Another story tells of Sufi Muslim Muhammad Saim al-Dar. In 1378, he supposedly saw local peasants make offerings to the Sphinx for a good harvest. Enraged, al-Dar cut away at the face as an act of iconoclasm. We can pull the plug on this theory too, since research suggests that the Hooter was pilfered between the 3rd and 10th centuries AD, making Eldar's story too late. All in all, we probably will never know what happened to the creature's snout. I'm just surprised that in over 4,000 years without a nose, it hasn't asphyxiated. Room Rustlers. Okay, so far we've heard about houses being absconded away, but what about a room? I'm not talking about any old room, either. I'm talking about the Amber Room. Dubbed the eighth wonder of the world, it was a series of stunning gold-leafed panels adorned with mosaics. 
Unsurprisingly valuable, modern estimates put it's worth somewhere between $145 to $290 million. Originally created by the German Baroque sculptor Andreas Schluter, in 1701 he fashioned it for the Prussian royal court from 6.6 .6 tons of amber. Imagine all the dinosaurs he could have cloned from that. Eventually, it went on to display at the Berlin City Palace owned by the Prussian Empire, now modern-day Germany. In 1716, Frederick Wilhelm gifted the room to Peter the Great as a sign of friendship between their two countries. Sure enough, by 1755, the room found its way to Catherine Palace in Leningrad, Russia. All was going well until World War II came and ruined everything, as World War II has a tendency to do. In 1941, German forces stormed through Russia, making their way to Leningrad. Curators in the palace tried hiding the room by covering it in plain wallpaper, but their plan failed, and the invading soldiers ransacked the palace, and in 36 hours, the room was stripped bare. The panels were loaded into crates and transported to Konigsberg Castle, where the room was reassembled. The German government believed that since the room was German-made, it belonged in Germany. Things didn't get much better for the Amber Room. In 1944, RAF planes bombed Konigsberg and the room was considered destroyed. While the original may be gone forever, the tale doesn't end there. In 1979, the Soviet government commissioned a replica of the room, including all the painstakingly inlaid details. After 24 years, with partial funding from Germany, the project was completed at a cost of $11 million. The reconstructed Amber Room was then installed in the Catherine Palace. Now there's a room that's worth its weight in gold, or amber. Arjack. Arrest me, ITs, for now we be sailing in the scurvy shores of treachery. <laughs> uh, sorry, pirate voices murder on the vocal cords. It was all because we're now taking a look at the most dastardly pirate of them all, Edward Teach, or as he's better known, Blackbeard. In the late 1710s, Blackbeard terrorized the Atlantic on his ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge. The boat measured 24.6 feet at the beam and a whopping 103 feet in length. It was armed to the teeth with 40 cannons, a crew of around 124 scallywags, and plenty of room for treasure. Truth be told, Blackbeard's fearsome reputation preceded him, and most of his victims offered up their booty without a fight. But how in the heck did he obtain the ship? Did he get it on sail? No. A true blackguard, Blackbeard stole the vessel near the island of Martinique in the Caribbean in November of 1717. Before that, it was known as La Concorde, a French slaving ship. The French captain and crew, outnumbered and weakened from a grueling journey across the Atlantic, surrendered to the formidable pirate who commandeered the ship. Look at me, short. Sure. I'm the captain now. Blackbeard kept ten members of the French crew and set the rest free, including those who'd been enslaved. Maybe he wasn't all bad, I guess. Yet everything went pear-shaped for the Queen Anne in June 1718, when the ship ran aground on a shoal off North Carolina. Blackbeard abandoned the ship, making off with all the loot and a few of his favorite crew. While the captain met his end at the hands of pirate hunters in November that year, the fate of his stolen vessel was a mystery, until 1996 when a shipwreck was discovered around the same area. For over 15 years, it was excavated and studied, and in 2011, it was confirmed to be <coughs> Blackbeard's ship. That's it. Unfortunately, my recording booth has also been stolen with me inside. Looks like I have no choice but to make a part three of this series. If you'd be down with that, be sure to let me know in the comments below, and thanks for watching.